Hello. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about acting and astrology and the placements that are influential to get one into acting. And it's very, very hard to do that. So this won't be the full, uh, full teaching or lesson on that, but this will be a good introduction if you're interested in that, if you're interested in studying that. It's 11, 11 a.m., May 7th, 2018. Okay, so to begin with, the planet of acting, most people would think is Venus. And uh, both Western and Vedic astrologers kind of just like really lump just anything remotely related to entertainment in with Venus, and it's not always the case. The actual planet, of course, Venus is the planet of entertainment, but an actor is uh, is not the same as entertainment. And so an actor, the skill of acting is Mercury. And so Mercury is the planet that makes one an actor and makes one involved in that, not Venus for entertainment. Though Venus is very important because, again, it represents entertainment and that's what acting is for. So you actually need both of those planets for career planets. They need to be either the ruling planet, they need to be the Atmakarika or with the Atmakarika in the Navamsha, or they need to be in the Pada. And uh, I'm actually going to show a few. I'm going to get a little bit technical with techniques and stuff. But in general, if you're watching my channel, you might notice, well, well actually, you might not be able to notice this since I haven't shared it, but I don't share that much really technique-centered stuff because I don't know. I kind of just feel like I want to be more careful about who I teach that stuff to, especially a lot of uh, Jaimini techniques because the ones that I, I just, I've developed on my own a lot of ones that I find to be incredibly powerful. I don't really want to share with anyone. And the ones that I learned are already so powerful that I don't really feel like sharing them with people because they get diluted so easily. It's not that I think like, oh, someone's going to go and use it in an evil way. That's more like, their karma and God's will if that has to happen. So I don't worry about that. But I just think that people dilute the information tremendously. Like most all this Jaimini stuff that I am going to mention, most of it's covered in an audio course Ernst Wilhelm taught 10 years ago. Um, and again, that's been out for a decade, but is there thousands and thousands of amazing astrologers that use this? No, there's not. And most people who study this stuff are just confused or think they know things that they don't. I mean, it took me like four years of listening to that over and over on a daily basis, those classes and practicing them, not just listening to them, testing them out on every chart of every career, everyone I knew before. And again, four years later, I finally started to feel like, yeah, I could teach this. Yeah, I could do this. But nowadays it's like, I don't know, at that time, Ernst was not well known. No one knew him. So I was one of the only people. So I was harping about him a lot. Now I don't really want to harp about him that much because he is very popular and he's well known. And now there's all these people who are kind of just like blindly listening to everything that he says. And people are saying like, oh, if he said it, it must be true no matter what. And that's not what he wants you to think. And that's not how you should think to become a great astrologer. You don't get the, the wisdom or the developed intuition or the eye of the Veda from just learning from another person who has it. You get it from you learning and then applying that and working that out and testing it and seeing it and having the aha moments of your own. So the thing with like, like a nurse is always teaching new classes and doing new stuff, but most people aren't geniuses like him. And so we can't digest information at these rates. So most people, and this is actually true for almost everyone who studies astrology in general, most people are suffering from mental indigestion. And like just the Lajitadi of Ashtas, I remember telling Ryan this, like, after our uh, first year of really getting into those. No, this was, like, three years into it. And I told Ryan he got a good laugh at it because I told him, I was like, yeah, anyone who thinks that they still understand the Avashtas in their first two years is just is either just lying or just doesn't realize how much there is there. You know what I mean? That's all there is to it. They just don't know how much there really is there or they're just lying and trying to act like they have all of this you know, information because it's an invisible thing. You can kind of act like you have all this, you know what I mean? When you don't, no one can really know. Um, it's an eighth house thing, not a second house thing. Um, 
So I just want to say all that, you know, so when you're learning and studying, I think it's weird how socialized all of the studying of astrology is. And I just want to stay away from that more and more as I go, as I grow more and more. Um, and it's kind of really distracting and it's not how I learned initially. I learned like astrology when I was living in the mountains. I didn't even have the internet. I just had books and charts. Oh, chickadee just landed inside my porch. And yeah, it was just this beautiful, peaceful thing. And I could just think on my own, what does this book mean? What does this text mean? I didn't have all these other people telling me this is what it means. And I don't know, I think there's, there's something good that is in that and that you can miss that if you're just on social media or like just the way that our culture is it's like very superficial this idea of just googling oh you get it you ask the google oh it tells you this is what the answer is um and it doesn't ever help us develop our own uh mercury and solar intelligence of like critical thinking and, and research and examination so take your time when you're studying and if you're going to study something like logitati of Ashtas, just give yourself three years. Be like, yeah, I'm just going to study this. And if it takes a year or two or three, that's fine. And I'm not going to feel rushed. And what you're doing there is you're, you're improving all your karma automatically. You're strengthening your Saturn. Because Saturn normally gets rushed and agitated by Mars like it is right now. And so by doing that, if you have that agitation, you just dissolve that a little bit more. And so you'll learn better while you're learning as when you go from it in that approach you won't feel like oh i need to learn all this you know and then next tomorrow i have to learn even all this more stuff and all the more 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 so this is just sort of like some chit chat about how you should learn and how you should study um in astrology in my opinion and i've been wanting to say this for a while i was going to make a video about it so hopefully that will be enough on that so now back to back to actors and astrology so again, to tie this all back into what I was saying is that this is just the beginning and of, of an explanation of people's charts, but there's so far you can go with this stuff. And with career in general, you could spend your whole life developing these techniques and still learning more about this person's chart. Um, before I go into any charts, though, I have to explain that um, more about what it is that makes one an actor. So... From the Jaimini angle, there's a certain planet, the Atmakarika, that's usually a very important career planet for the person, and the planets that are with that and uh, can also do that in the Navamsha. Sorry about that. Um, so here's a really neat thing, though, about acting um, and karma, is that the actor can only play the role of a, they can only play a role that is shown in their chart as a role that they will play. And that is so cool because if you think about it, an actor who gets famous for a role, he's like created a new being, a new birth chart of that person, or he's, or that's the person that's really famous. Like when you love, um, like, you know, actors hate it when you call them by their hero name, like, Oh, um, like Roddy Dangerfield's Iron Man, you know, or whatever. So, Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Sorry, I said it. Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. And so he would be upset if you yelled Iron Man at him, but you would say Robert and he'd be like, oh, hey, what's up? He likes that more. They don't, you know, there's sort of that, that sort of attitude where they don't want to be called by their, their role, their actor names. But it's funny because those roles are actually just as strongly in their chart as the person that they are. And that's what's so funny because uh, Mercury, the planet of acting, is also the planet of Vishnu, the planet who becomes everyone and everything and, you know, and, and plays the role of all of Vishnu is me talking to you right now and you are Vishnu listening. Um, so Vishnu is always changing and Mercury has that quality of being volatile and always changing. And you know, always kind of developing a new side of themselves. It's also like the merchant, like the vice quality, like always developing a new skill or a new aspect of their personality. And so do playing a new role, you know, like actors are always like that where they're, Oh, now I'm like exploring the lives of, you know, antebellum 
uh, women in at this time in this period, you know, and then then the actress goes and plays another role where she's a she's an alien on a spaceship or something, and and so they're getting to explore different sides of themselves and develop themselves in the course of this. That's sort of like what Vishnu is developing while Vishnu is learning to act in the form of these people. But there is also like a, a like this is speaking to that multifaceted quality of Mercury, like where Mercury is very multi-talented and multi-dimensional and always doing new things. So it really suits, actors are really suited for that because of that, when, if they have that mercurial intelligence to always be kind of moving on to a new thing and doing a lot of different things at the same time. Um, but what's neat is that uh, like most actors do get typecasted really, they get typecasted for what they look like. Um, and you know someone who like the rock that wrestler guy you know he's only going to get casted for roles like hercules or things like that he's never going to get casted for um <clears throat> an out of place role and so those roles that the person will be typecasted for are really shown in their chart and i'm gonna i can do more you know separate videos of more in-depth examples of that but then when you get an actor who's like a real actor's actor like a real amazing like human chameleon, they will have a chart that really kind of speaks to that more and really shows like it's a powerful chart, but there's a lot going on in it. Um, and that a good example of that would be like Vincent D'Onofrio um, and a little bit of an example that would be Edward Norton, but even Edward Norton still plays only roles that are within the scope of his chart. And he's a Scorpio rising and he plays a lot of roles of like really powerful, like destructive, like explosive people. And I will give a full video on Edward Norton's chart because I love him. He's fascinating. and He's a good example of more of a, a refined, skilled, you know, educated actors sort of approach. But either way, you'll see that the chart speaks to the characters that they're going to be really famous for. Another example of this would be like Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is really most famous for Han Solo. And he actually didn't want to play Han Solo. He was called in just to read for other people who are auditioning to play, just to do the, the lines of Han while other people uh, audition for Luke or Leia or what have you. He was just brought in for that. And George Lucas was like, oh my God, I have to cast you. You're perfect for Han. And that's how fate works. And he was meant to play that role. And he should be. And that's astrology should show that. And it does. And he is a Libra rising. And again, well, no, not again. I may not have ever, you may not know this, but Libra is not this like really passive, everybody's okay sign like people think. Libra is a very idealistic sign. It's about fairness and balance. And if Venus is the predominant planet, then yeah, they might do be just friendly and, and harmonious. But uh, in his chart, in the charts of many Libras, like I know another Libra with Mars on the Ascendant, he's the most, he fights battles everywhere he goes, and he's never seeing things as fair. So he's always battling for that, for the fairness. And so Han Solo plays a smuggler, like a renegade, who's in the same way, like, he, Libra is the sign of being on the karmic ends of things. Like Aries is where you, ex you first did a karma. Libra is when you incarnate to face the other end of that. So you're oftentimes very upset by that, unless you've been good in your many lives before that. So you get thrown with tough things when you're a Libra ascendant. And it's how you deal with that and accept them and make peace with that that defines a lot of the path of a Libra. But for Han, Han plays this typical Libra archetype of like the badass rebel who kind of like um, refuses to accept the fate that he keeps getting thrown at, you know? So he breaks the rules, he breaks the law, he becomes a smuggler an outlaw, a gambler. These are things that Libra can actually get involved in. Libra can be very, and you know, Libra likes to party to begin with. So Libra can be this uh, sort of energy where one wants to just be really contrary because they feel rejected from the world. But enough on Libra, um, this is not what that's about. So actors in general will play the role that their chart speaks to and so if you ever i just really want to do charts for some actors because after studying some of this i can really see how oh my god like this guy doesn't even see how his chart is 
fitting the character he wants to audition for. I know he's going to get it. You know what I mean? Or the opposite. Um, so anyways, now with the technical details of what it takes to be an actor, you're going to want to see Mercury connecting to the first house, the ascendant for the body, the second house for speech, third house for skill and creative expression, and then the seventh house for public exposure. So that's four different house cusps that the, this planet has to be connected to, and that planet has to be the Atmakarika or connect to the Atmakarika in the important three Vargas, and then the uh, Ascendant has to connect to the Ascendant. And then all that also has to be going on for Venus as well. So there is a lot that has to be done, and that's why it's very hard to be an actor. And that's why most people who move to LA fail in their dream of becoming an actor or actress. Um, and uh, yeah, that's enough on that. All right, so now I'm going to share the screen of an actor who I really like. His name is Clark Gregg. He is not super well known, but he is, he is famous for playing a, the role of like a secret agent type of person in the Iron Man movie, and that came out in 2008, and then he played it again in Thor, which came out in 2011, and then again in The Avengers, he, he played this reoccurring role uh, in 2012. And then that was so successful that they made an entire TV show based on him as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all their little missions and escapades and everything. Now, S.H.I.E.L.D. is like the NSA or CIA. They're like this secret government organization that like protects the world from aliens or weird threats or psychic or supernatural threats or things that just otherwise aren't understandable. So that's really important to understand if you, you know, this is all taking, these are all like a series of movies and films that take place in the Marvel cinematic universe, or basically all the comic book stories of like Hulk and Iron Man and stuff. They made movies of them. They just recently made the Avengers infinity war one. This is all in that same kind of like world. And they're all, all those movies are connected. So this guy, uh, plays uh, Clark Gregg. He plays Agent Coulson, Agent Phil Coulson, who is like one of the head agents for S.H.I.E.L.D. So he basically, like when Iron Man gets his suit and all his powers, this guy shows up and is like, hey, uh, you know, just so you know, like there are a lot of people with powers like you and we need to monitor you and you're not the only one and, you know, we need to keep tabs on you and like welcome to this whole new world, this whole hidden underworld. So this, and then uh, those movies are amazing and great. And he plays just this like, like stoic character. You know how like those, he plays the perfect government G-man. Like the, that's a term for like your government agent, your man in black or men in black sort of thing. Like these uh, archetypes of those guys who show up like um, with the glasses and the suit and tie and they don't say anything or express any emotion and they just do their job and disappear and, you know, the person who invented the electric car, they just take them away and they disappear and end up on an island and we never hear from them again. So that's essentially who this character plays, or who he plays. So right away you should see this because Ascendant is Capricorn. Capricorn is the perfect Lagna for that. Capricorn is the opposite of the emotionally expressive sign of cancer. Capricorn is the most reserved, stoic, you know, orderly suit and tie type of person. Um, so Capricorn, his body is fitted for this role. The ruling planet goes into the second house. It's Saturn. It goes into Aquarius. Again, um, the strong qualities of stoic Saturn. It's with K2. So he's been this strong Saturn for many lives, not just one. So he can play this role really well. You know what I mean? Other interesting thing is uh, that's the house of speech. So again, we see second house uh, connecting to his ruling planet. That's good. It's also really cool because Saturn in the second and K2 will make someone really like be more reserved in their speaking and not say things that aren't necessary. And they'll be very good at withholding information that isn't that, that they maybe shouldn't have shared. Um, 
and they're just better at with, withholding information and keeping silent and keeping secret when it's necessary. So as a government agent, it's all based on compartmentalization. So again, perfect for that. He can keep secrets. He can talk only on his level of uh, clearance, as they call it in the show. Um, and my theory, like I've always thought, what would it, what would a person like that have? You know, a secret government agent type person. What placements would they have? And I always thought Rahu in the eighth. I've talked to other astrologers about that too. And you know, Rahu in the eighth would make you forced into finding all these supernatural, crazy things that make you feel like really surprised and overwhelmed and um, K2 in the second would make you not be able to speak much. And they're always having to be very emotionless, dry, dry people. You know what I mean? Like that's sort of the quality of a government um, agent. He has to be very dry. So we have these two uh, planets that are kind of dry in the second house. Um, Before I move on, one other thing that's neat about that K2 in the second house is that K2 connecting the second house of speech can give one like repetitive speech um, and weird speech issues, but they can also just repeat things a lot. They can be a type of person who just like is always repeating the same point. It's like, yeah, you've been saying that like a whole time I've ever known you. That's weird. Um, <laughs> you just won't move past it, you know? Um, but uh, so in the show, he dies and is sort of brought back to life with this crazy alien formula and all the stuff that's secret that we're not supposed to know about. Um, and he is constantly asked about, oh, how was Tahiti where he supposedly recovered? But he just keeps saying it's a magical place. Every time he says it, he doesn't know why. And it's because he was like, he later finds out that he was sort of had a much crazier operation done and had to sort of have memories replaced and have sort of be brainwashed, but not really just have his memories messed with and replaced. And so he can't seem to remember it. So his mind automatically just repeats that. And uh, that's just kind of neat because of the K2 repetitive speech thing. Like um, now I see why that, why he did such a good job with that and why that was like such a wild part of the first season when you're watching this show, you're wondering like, why is he doing that? Um, and they do a really good job with it. This show is really well written. It's not got a high budget. It's kind of like soap opery at times. It's for TV, but it's really an amazing show. And I'm very critical of television. I don't just watch anything on television at all. Um, so then, uh, and I'll, uh, yeah, so I already mentioned that. Um, so yeah, you know, Saturn in Aquarius is actually a placement that can, if it's connected to other like hidden or underworld type things, it can make one involved in just the underworld of things or like the counterculture, or they can be involved in like, a, or they could be in like the mafia or they could be in like a drug underworld, you know what I mean? Or something like that. So for him, his ruling planet Saturn's are in the K with K2, another hidden planet. He's got Rahu in the eighth meant to face hidden things. His Amakarak is with the 12th Lord in a hidden sign. Um, it's kind of all really strongly speak. His sun's in the fourth, his Venus in the fourth, and other kind of like beneath the earth hidden place. So there's a ton of things speaking to him being um, like dealing with hidden things or being an agent, you know, being um, uh, just dealing with that, the hidden world. And then the sun, Rashi aspecting his ascendant Lord and being exalted is speaking to the government service, very high level of government and doing work for the good, you know, for the exalted sun. And it rules Rahu, so that Rahu is favorable. So that Rahu in the eighth is speaking to a more favorable government service, you know, because the Leo is the government, so he works for the government. And then the other, like, another um, really neat thing is that in terms of Jaimini intelligence, Mercury is his Atmakarika, intelligence of investigating, and it's with these three other planets that are all giving intelligence. So he has the logical intelligence of Mars, the intuitive sort of emotional people, like social intelligence of Moon, where he understands people, he can tell them people are lying to him, Jupiter, just pure intuition. And what's cool is it's in the um, 
It's in the sign of Pisces, another like intuitive thing. And he is like the, towards the end of the episode, he's the one who always has these crazy aha moments while he's talking to someone and just like, they say something, and he just triggers an intuitive feeling and he just starts getting it and you just start, and then you just start following him and you're getting like these goosebumps. It's like, aha, ah, and this is all making sense moment. And uh, he's just really, really good at that. And so you can see all that shown there. Um, as well as that is the Pada for him. Saturn goes in the second, go one more over. Pisces becomes the Pada, holds Jupiter and Moon. So he's a Sri Mantaha, like I uh, said before, one who shines in their field because he has the placement that says that. So when Iron Man was released, it was released in May of 2008. Jupiter was crossing his ascendant. Let me minimize that. Um, you can see here in this box of the transits, Capricorn is his ascendant. This was in uh, May of 2008, and Jupiter was transiting his ascendant, opening up the doors for him, opening up a lot of windows for him. That was his big break. It was also his big break because his ruling planet, Shani, was in the ninth. So Saturn there in the ninth, the house of fortune. So Saturn doesn't go there for 30 years. And when it went through there was his big break, you know? Um, ninth house is the house of things like, you know, unfolding for us and our big break. And also nice how Venus was so strong in Taurus in the fifth house and in a sign that deals with the arts and it was sun in Taurus. Uh, oh my gosh, like almost down to the exact day of today. <laughs> That's neat. I've been wanting to make this video for a month now and I didn't get to make it till today. And so sun was in the fifth house in a sign of the arts and the fifth house is creative expression and Dharma. So you had one, two, three, uh, four out of seven Karaka planets in the trines at that time. That's so cool. So always keep in mind transits. We're going to take it one step further and we're going to look at, we're going to look at, uh, the, yes, the Chatushtaya Dasha. He was just started to run Gemini, Gemini. Made a note here so I don't forget. Sometimes you can forget when you're looking at technical things. In the, um, you notice in the Rashi chart, Gemini gets a lot of manifesting strength. Jupiter, Mercury, and Mercury again because Mercury is the lord of the sign as well. So three times manifesting strength um, with the Rashi aspect there. And uh, then looking at the D60 over here, Gemini holds Jupiter, manifesting strength. Even more important because Jupiter is the Lagna Lord of the D60, so that sets off his path. When a sign runs that holds the Lagna Lord of that Varga, that means there's going to be a major change, Chara, in their path unfolding. Navamsa, Chara Navamsa. So that's, that's kind of how we use that. I did a whole video on the Chara Navamsa um for the Saptarishi's channel so if you're curious of that um it's on a playlist on this youtube channel if you scroll down um if you want to know like how i'm how i'm doing that if you don't understand how that works um oh and then check out the d40 chart kavidamsha for all sort of things being great auspicious or inauspicious and he's lucky because he does have a strong Venus and Moon on the Ascendant. That's definitely worth mentioning, connecting to the seventh cusp of public exposure. So that's speaking to fame. Having the Atmakaraka in the seventh also speaks to fame, publicity, um, giving manifesting strength. But then also Jupiter is Rashi aspecting Gemini. So what I wanted to talk about with this was Gemini in the D40 gets, again, really strong manifesting strength from Jupiter. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I could keep, I'll stop for now. Um, there are a few other things that I was going to mention, but it's it's pretty much good enough. Um, you, you can really, like I said earlier at the beginning of this video, you can keep going. I could go all day, but I've got to go. I've got, you know, I've got to do my readings and stuff. So I hope you guys enjoy this, and um, I hope this helps you guys get a little bit of understanding of acting and seeing the acting in chart, and maybe just helps you read the chart better. Um, and I'll, I'm going to do some more videos on actors. If you have any ones that you want me to do, let me know. But if it's an actor I don't really like, I might not do it. 
um, cause I'm only going to do the ones that I, you know, want to do. This is kind of an obscure one. I recommend watching that show agents of shield. If you're, you know, if you want something fun like that to watch, like an action, an action drama, suspense, mystery sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, okay. Thanks y'all. Take care.